Something happened, they don't know what, but suddenly there were modern humans. Now we ask, where does the creationist typically go to get their evidence? And let's pause and remind ourselves, I know it's true about me, that all of us accept evidence based on what we believe or want to believe in the first place, isn't that right? So for the creationist, the evidence is in a literal translation of ancient scripture, Genesis 1.1. There was nothing, and then God or divine power made everything. And by the way, this focus on uh, translation of ancient scripture and finding truth in it is true about many fundamentalist beliefs. And then we have to ask, where does the creationist go to find truth? I mean, we all want an answer. For the creationist, their truth is in faith that the scripture is right. What this means is that the creationist mode of finding truth is that they don't have to. They have an a priori belief in the truth. The evidence is incidental. And here we come to the key point, in my view, between science and faith. Faith is certainty without proof. It doesn't need any evidence. That's why we say we take it on faith or have faith baby. I mean, there's nothing there. That's all right. But science is proof, proof, and more proof with never any certainty. Always open to new facts, new evidence that break down the old laws and theories and give us new ones. And some people just simply aren't very comfortable with that. So now I know you're going to wonder, where are the moderates in this? Well, I put big blue check marks where the moderates would pretty much agree with the evolutionists. That's why I think they're a really important group, except for a key area, and that is the role of gods. Moderates are not sure. For some moderates, there is virtually no role, and if there is a role at all for moderates, it's definitely hands off. So those are the key players, I would say, in the debate. And by the way, um, I had an opportunity to talk to a creationist recently and tried to talk to him about the moderates. For the creationists, the moderates are simply people who have not yet made up their minds. Why is it, aside from religious belief, or our egotistical hope that we're part of a divine miracle instead of simply the result of nature's magnificence, is it hard for us to believe in evolution? So many people still cannot accept evolution. Well, there are some aspects of evolution, some concepts that are extremely difficult to grasp, even for folks who read a lot about it. They're often misunderstood, and they're always misconstrued by the creationists in the debate. And I call these the ABCs of the evolution controversy. So let's go inside that controversy a little. A, bet you know what that one is. The abracadabra effect. I can't do this without some magic and that's it. Bats. Bats are the only mammals that truly fly. And as you know, they are able to locate, chase, and capture their prey on the wing in the dead of night. And they do this through an amazing complex adaptation a sensory survival skill known as echolocation. I call it bat sonar. Now, the earliest evidence we have for a bat is a 50 million year old fossil bat. 50 million year old fossil bat that looks just like a modern bat. Every feature in that fossil bat is just like the features in the modern bat already preformed, including those special features needed for bat sonar. Now, here comes the interesting part. There are no pre-bats. There are no earlier fossil bats in the fossil record. There are no pre-bats, abracadabra. Now the creationists would say, ah, a miracle, a bat. God made a bat. Ridiculous. No. <laughs> Fossilization is very rare. We know that. We're lucky to have that 50 million year old bat. In the 150 years since Darwin, we've dug up a oh, millions of fossils and we filled in the fossil evolutionary trail of hundreds and thousands of animals, like the whales. Recent exciting fossil finds of ancient whales in Pakistan have helped us fill in the fossil trail and confirm what we long suspected, that the distant evolutionary relative of a whale was a large hippo-like creature that walked on the land, then became semi-aquatic, developed flippers, started swimming out to sea, became whales, and that was the story. So we now have confirmation that, that was exactly what happened. No, we can say that creationist evolution wasn't running backwards. It was just running forwards. Abracadabra, no, nature's magic. The brain, the human brain, 
Now, isn't that the one organ that we feel really separates us from all the other animals? The brain, it's the seat of what really makes us human. I call it our highly evolved consciousness with a conscience. Now, I know you all know that we are 98% similar to the chimps in our genetic sequences. We hear that over and over again. First it was 96, now it's 98. What that means is that we are less than 2% different from our closest evolutionary relative, the chimp. Now, the creationists will want to argue, uh, how can such a small genetic difference make such a big difference between the brain of the human and the chimp? And we look around sometimes and wonder. <laughs> well, it doesn't, and it doesn't have to. Now that we've sliced and diced the human genome and we've read the sequences, in the last couple of months we have a good first rough draft of the genome of the chimp. And so we're busy comparing sequences and genes and everything like that. And what we're comparing is not the 2%, we're comparing all the other genes, the thousands of genes that we share with the chimps. And guess what? We're finding some very interesting stuff. 20% of all the things we've started comparing, 20% of the genes that we share with the, with the chimp that are important to the evolution of both modern humans and chimps, 20% of them show very different levels of activity in the human and the chimp. A lot of those areas are in the brain and specifically in those locations dedicated to speech and language. So even where we're similar, we can be different. As we all know, evolution is a process, and each step in evolution isn't a one-time roll of the dice. It has a history. It's dependent on all the other events that have come before it. Now, in our relatively short lifetimes, few of us will get a chance to witness chance operating in evolution. But today, for you, I have a modern-day example. 5% of all Caucasian men who harbor the HIV virus, the virus that causes AIDS, never show signs or symptoms of the disease. 5%. We also know that in many of those men, there is a genetic mutation that directly affects the immune cell in our immune system. It is also the host cell for the AIDS virus. And among those fortunate fellows who carry that mutation, the virus can float around in the bloodstream but is unable to get inside that host cell and infect and survive and reproduce. And so those lucky guys that harbor the HIV virus never get AIDS. We also know that that specific mutation has been around for millennia for a long time, just hanging out there with all the other genetic mutations that we all have in our bodies. But they're not hurting us. They're just what we would call evolutionarily neutral, just waiting for a chance when confronted by a stress, an unusual stress in the environment, such as the AIDS virus, that mutation means survival, it means life for those fortunate few fellows. And that's happening today. They would say they're very lucky. I would say that's simply chance operating in evolution. So in summary, we've talked about three key areas and now you'll be able to speak to them that are often picked on by the creationists in the evolution creation debate. One, abracadabra, the abracadabra effect. In fact, we may always have gaps in the fossil record. B, the brain, how evolution uses similar genetic pathways to build complexity, such as in the brain and the eye. And finally, chance, how randomness, luck, and chance truly do operate in evolution. And in conclusion, because I know that we're, we're thinking a lot about this topic today. On behalf of the connection between science and faith, I'd like to say I believe there will always be that tension in the human question between science and faith. We may not be arguing about evolution as we know it today, but we're always going to be arguing about some issue concerning human origins.